Today we're going to discuss parasites, everybody's most favorite topic, uh, including mine, uh, for various reasons. It's a very essential concept that we're really going to discuss before we talk about protozoa and helminths, because the protozoa and helminths that we will discuss are all parasites. And it's important to get an understanding about the nature of relationships between species, especially the, the relationship called parasitism, so that we can really describe diseases caused by parasites and also think about different ways that we can eradicate parasitic diseases. So parasites are, are, are biologically common uh, sets of relationships that occur in plants, uh, in animals, and in humans. Uh, parasites can live in human hosts and they tend to cause diseases that include protozoan diseases, uh, worm type diseases or helminths, and uh, insect borne diseases. And, you know, if we think about this definition of parasitism, really all of the pathogens that we've talked about in here are essentially parasitic in relationship to the human host. And you'll see just the wide range here of parasites, including insects and worms and these protozoan uh, one-celled organism. And we're gonna review many of these organisms in our uh, helminth and also protozoan lectures. So how widespread are these uh, parasitic diseases? And they're, they're very widespread. And it's not they're not just found in the tropics. They're also found in more temperate climates. They're found in the subtropics. And, but most of them truly are localized uh, in the tropics. And the biggest, most prominent example is malaria, which is a parasitic disease. And it's caused by a one-cell protozoan, and that protozoan is carried, of course, by the mosquito. Malaria kills uh, 660,000 individuals uh, annually, and most of them are, in, are among young children in sub-Saharan Africa. But other parasitic diseases include some of the ones that are considered neglected tropical diseases, and these are diseases that were designated as neglected by the WHO, and these are infectious diseases that, while they're very widespread, are not do not receive a lot of uh, research dollars. And some of these diseases that are parasitic diseases include filariasis and guinea worm disease and, uh, you know, a few others. And, and these are diseases that uh, are widespread, in, especially in the subtropics. So we will review some of these when we talk about other parasitic diseases found in worms and also in protozoa. So what is the extent of malaria? So if we use malaria as a marker or an indicator of parasitic diseases, you can see, now this is, this data is about 10 years old, but, but truly it's still, it, it, you know, malaria is not a disease that has been uh, cured or uh, prevented. So th this pattern has continued where, you know, malaria is basically endemic in the tropics, in the tropical countries, and uh, especially in Africa, but also in, in India and the Southern uh, Asian countries and South America, uh, Central America, and Mexico. Now, I've had some personal experience both in my own family and with other students and in my own life uh, I, in one of the, the microbiology courses I taught, a student of mine came up to me and she uh, was from Africa. She had lived in Nigeria for much of her life. And she told me, first of all, she told me that she herself had malaria, but then she told me that virtually everybody she knew also had malaria, that it's very, as, as, the, as the map indicates, it's very endemic, many, many people have malaria, it's very common. She didn't think that much of it. And in fact, she was, the lecture that I had given in that particular class, there were a lot of things that she didn't know. 
but more importantly, the fact that it was so common and it, it for her, and, and some of the symptoms of malaria appear just like influenza, she uh, and 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 she explained that also people when they're young have much more severe cases and as they grow up the um the types of malaria that they are the symptoms of malaria disease that they get are are less extreme and so in that regard we're going to see that um most of the deaths uh due to malaria occur among children now my own uh, father and my own family, he had malaria as a young man and uh, he, he traveled all over the world. And it was interesting when we were growing up, you know, occasionally he would come down with these flu-like symptoms and he, he just told us that this was part of the whole malaria disease. And then the other uh, part of it that's actually affected my own life is I've been traveling to India Gosh, I've traveled now in the last year two or three times, and every time I go, I have to take these preventive uh, prophylactic malaria medications that are actually quite expensive. And there's a whole controversy going on in in among these these countries where malaria is an uh, endemic to try and lower the cost of these malaria medications. So one, every time I've gone to India, I've had to take these uh, malaria medications and I take them before I go, during my trip, and even after my trip. And we'll talk about different treatments for malaria when we spend much more time on malaria in the protozoa lecture. So what are these, so Parasitism is certainly one form of relationship between species, but we have other kinds of relationships too. We have uh, mutualism and commensalism. So the next few slides, we're gonna talk about the differences uh, between those different uh, types of relationships. So symbiosis is really the term that's used to describe relationships between species. And that term is very uh, applicable to the discussions we've had about pathogens and hosts. So symbiosis as a definition is a relationship between two different organisms that are living together and that association is beneficial to at least one of the members of the pair or both of them. Uh, and, and so there are three different types of symbiotic relationships. Uh, one type is called mutualism, where both members of, or both members of the two species uh, benefit from the relationship. We have uh, a term called commensalism, where one member of the relationship, one species, is uh, positively affected, and the other one is unharmed or unaffected. And many of the bacteria that live in our gut are considered uh, commensal bacteria. And, uh, and, and, and some of them are mutual. Some of the bacteria in our gut, and, and it's, it's being, you know, science is uncovering these species of bacteria that are proving to be very mutual in relationship to uh, the human actually gaining benefit from the relationship. And one example is vitamin K, that vitamin K in the colon is actually produced by bacteria that live there. And that's one of the primary sources of vitamin K uh, in humans is these commensal or actually mutually beneficial bacteria that live in the colon. So then the definition of parasitism is where one member of or one species of the two uh, benefit from the relationship and the other member is actually harmed. And it's, it's, it's really at the expense of the, the other uh, species. So in, in terms of a specific definition, a parasite is an organism that lives on or within a host organism and the parasite gets its food from the host and it's at the expense and that that's very important to consider it is at the expense of its host now there are several 
Uh, there are three major classes of parasites that cause disease. One of them is protozoa. One of them is helminths, which we talked about as another more scientific name for worms. And the third are really insects, but they're called ectoparasites. And we'll, uh, the next slide will discuss what those are. So ectoparasites or organisms such as the fleas and lice and ticks that attach or burrow within the skin and remain for relatively long periods of time. So for instance, the mosquito is not considered a parasite because it doesn't live on the skin or under the skin, whereas the fleas, lice, and ticks uh, certainly do. So they're, they're actually a special class of parasites. Now, these parasitic infections are pretty ubiquitous throughout the uh, human host. They can live in quite a few uh, locations, unfortunately, and um, they can lodge and remain in the human host for very long periods of time. So you can see that many of these parasites are worms, of course, and, and then some of them are protozoa as well. So an uh, uh, interesting one to look at is this Ascaris, uh, which is a name for a type of worm. And boy, this Ascaris can live in quite a few different places. It can live on the skin. It can live, unfortunately, in the brain. Uh, it can live in, it looks like in the heart, in the lungs, um, in the intestine, and uh, of course, I, I, as I mentioned, uh, in the uh, skin. And so some of these uh, parasites we'll actually discuss, but as you can see, many of them are worms, and uh, certainly they can live in the intestines. We, we even have some that can live in the, in the bladder, which as you remember, is a pretty uh, acidic environment. Uh, so boy, these um, parasites uh, do a great job of being able to find a place that they can live in. And uh, as I mentioned, sometimes they can live for very long periods of time. So what about the mosquito? As we mentioned, is a vector. And we talked about vectors in the epidemiology lecture. And vectors are specialized, uh, you, most of the time, insects. And they convey a parasite from host to host. So we're going to, as I, as I talked about, we're actually going to talk about the example of malaria, uh, which is carried by mosquitoes, but we're also going to talk about a disease that's carried by sand fleas. And that's going to be, uh, in the protozoa lecture. And, uh, and we'll, we'll speak about both of those diseases in great depth. So our first example really addresses uh, the question of whether symbiotic relationships can change. And most importantly, the question really focuses on, so if you were, for instance, asked this question as part of your uh, exams, the most important uh, transition, so to speak, would be, for instance, from a commensal relationship to a parasitic one. And that can actually happen, and a really good example is actually in the, in the bacterial realm, where we have this disease called Crohn's, C-R-O-H-N-S. It's an intestinal disease. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease. And uh, it's a situation where bacteria that are usually commensal in the digestive tract get recognized by the immune system as essentially being pathogenic. And, and so it isn't so much that the organism itself goes through a change, but the relationship changes where the immune system, which is normally views the commensal bacteria as basically friendly and leaves them alone, in Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disease, there are certain times uh, when somebody has Crohn's where they get the, what's called these flare-ups where for some unknown at this time reason, often by stress or other uh, triggers, 
these, um, the immune system recognizes then at that time, at the flare, at the time of the flare, it recognizes these bacteria as being pathogenic. And so then, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the bacteria doesn't change, but the relationship does. And so then the uh, immune system attacks these, excuse me, normal, uh, normally commensal bacteria. So that's a great example of how a relationship that is usually commensal can become pathogenic and it becomes, or pathogenic or parasitic, and it becomes that way because of the immune system. What are the most effective ways to eliminate parasitic infections? Well, number one, I, I'm going to highlight these principles that is very that are very important to remember. One of them, and we talked about this in the introductory eukaryotic lecture. The number one, remember the eukaryotic cells resemble one another. They have the same type of architecture, so to speak. So. The human organism, the human immune system, it is much more difficult for the human immune system to recognize an infection from another eukaryotic cell, whereas it's so-called easier or, you know, in a sense, more identifiable to have an infection from a prokaryotic organism like a bacteria. So for instance, it, the antigens that are, uh, that are expressed on a prokaryotic cell are much more different from the antigens expressed on another eukaryotic cell. And we had this discussion in the fungal lectures as well. And remember that fungi are also eukaryotic cells, so so are protozoa. Okay, and remember protozoa, you know, have a lipid bilayer, they have organelles just like the human organism. And, and remember some of the human cells have flagella as do the protozoans. So in a sense, uh, targeting the immune system is potentially a challenging place to think about eliminating parasitic uh, infections. So obviously targeting the organism itself. So if, for instance, uh, the parasite has a stage that um, actually lives outside the host, so that particular stage would be a great place to eradicate or to attempt to eradicate uh, the, the, the stage of the parasite that lives outside the human host. So for instance, if there were spores or different life stages that occur outside the human, that would be a great place to target the parasite. Another important, if the parasite has a vector. So for instance, one of the ways that uh, malaria, the incidence of malaria is reduced is by, for instance, um, draining swamps, applying, uh, not, not so much any longer, but earlier, applying uh, pesticides to eradicate uh, these uh, mosquitoes. Sometimes oil is put on the water to also influence uh, uh, their life cycle, the actual life cycle, life cycle of a mosquito. So another good way is to address the actual vector. So if you can eliminate the vector, then you've eliminated the disease. Another possibility is truly identifying stages of the um, parasite that may be more antigenically identifiable. So one of the things, one of the lines of research that's going on with malaria in terms of developing vaccines is really developing vaccines against certain life stages of the protozoa, or pla it's called plasmodium, and, and actually developing uh, ways in which you can have partially 
uh, antigenic determination based on some of the life cycles. Because again, if you can eliminate a stage of life of the protozoa, then you can certainly eliminate the organism. And remember, vaccination is really a way that we can train the immune system to be able to identify that pathogen when it enters uh, the host organism again. So that concludes our lecture for parasites. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.